Hey, Backward Compatiblings, this is Chris. Before we get started today, I wanted to jump on and let you know that we had a few issues with this week's audio while we were recording. Um, I cleaned it up as best I could um, in post, but we still have a few issues with it, so it's not going to sound super clean. We apologize for that. Uh, Thanks for bearing with us, and we'll do what we can to get this fixed for next time. Uh, But for now, the show will go on. As a side note, without giving you any chance to respond, I think House of Cards is overrated. Whoa! Whoa! (laughs) Hey! Hey! But with Orange is the New Black, we wait I know you're wrong. (laughs) This week on Backward Compatible, with episodic and appointment gaming on the rise, how much time should you have between episodes to build anticipation without losing interest? Plus, the crew talks about game-to-movie and movie-to-game adaptations. What do you lose by switching media, and what can you gain? BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Backward Compatible. All right, everybody. Uh, we're here for our fourth podcast here at BackwardCompatible.com. As always, I'm Richard. I'm Chris. And I'm Jim. And uh, we're here to talk about uh, more of the popular image, I guess, of games and film and new media. Uh, We were recently seeing the news about um, the Last of Us film that's coming out. Mm -hmm. There was the Last of Us live was it Broadway or was it just uh, like they did on stage? And it was in California. Did you, did you guys not see this? They did a Broadway show of Last of Us. Yeah, it wasn't Broadway. It was they did a live performance of The Last of Us where they had the cast, the voice actors, read their lines in like dramatic. Please tell me it wasn't a musical. I don't know. I don't think it was a musical. They should sing their their lines. Oh, that God, would be interesting. No, please. Well, so they didn't. Uh, they they said they were going to broadcast live some of it. But because it was only some of it, I didn't want to tune in for the little bits and pieces, so I missed it. But from what I understand, they just read their lines in dramatic fashion, like they were acting out The Last of Us. Hmm. But so with this announcement, we started talking about all of the terrible movie-to-game adaptations out there and the game-to-movie adaptations that we all want to see. For years, everybody talked about, we want a Bioshock movie. We want a Bioshock movie. But does anybody really think that that would succeed? No. Well, Probably not, no. <laughs> I wouldn't even say that, I, to me, I'm not interested in a Bioshock movie. I think the experience of the game is great on its own. Mm, yeah. I, I think you'd lose something in that translation. And the big reveal at the end all has to do with the um, the nature of like the player and how you're just sort of going through the motions. For sure, yeah. for sure. But then, like, you know, they, they wrapped up Warcraft filming. I think it was three weeks ago, they finished filming on the Warcraft movie. Huh. Hmm. And they just announced a few days ago, I think, the Last of Us movie's coming up. So, yeah, that's did sort of what we want to... Did you hear the casting as well? I was hearing they were casting... Um, Maisie, Maisie Williams. Yeah, yeah. As, as that's LA. the rumor. I don't think it's been verified yet, but yeah, Maisie Williams, who plays Arya Stark in Game of Thrones, is apparently slated to play Ellie in the last one. Now they're going to make sure that they wax the unibrow before they start filming, right? What? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jim, get out of here. <laughs> Maisie Williams is perfect in every way. <laughs> Didn't they They sort of base on... Oh, jeez, what was that? What was that actress, actress's name? Um... I would have known it if you hadn't have brought it up. Ellen Page. Yeah, Ellen Page. <laughs> there we go. Oh, yeah, there was that whole controversy over, like, uh, apparently she was suing Beyond over... Two Souls, right? Wasn't it called Beyond Two Souls? Yeah, Beyond the two game Souls. is Beyond Two Souls. Well, yes. that, I mean, she was, like, in that. It was supposed to be her, but in The Last of Us, um, the, the sidekick character, I mean, Ellie, yeah. Ellie, yeah, um, looked a lot like Ellen Page, and a lot of people thought that Ellen Page was in it. And then they intentionally went back and redid the character. Well, they said, they came out and said that they modeled her after Ellen Page just because they love Ellen Page. Mm-hmm. And then they were like, okay, well, we're releasing Beyond Two Souls. This is a little too similar. So yeah. you're going to need to redesign her. She's, yeah. she's also, at this point, too old to play Ellie in a movie. That's true, anyway, actually. So Speaking of out. Ellen Page being younger, have you guys seen Hard Candy? No. Awesome movie. Yes, I have, actually. So good. It's it? Ellen Page it's essentially disturbing. plays like a girl who was like a pedophile came after her and like like online internet predator huh. and she totally fucking like rips his nuts off. Like oh, wow. literally. But isn't she she's actually she's sort of the um the hunter in that movie, right? Right. She's yeah. kind of going after Yeah, she's like a child predator hunter. 
Yeah, like Chris Hansen, except awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah kind of like the girl. Why, why don't you sit down? Have, have a cookie <laughs> yeah, and like, my axe. <laughs> <laughs> but so that's sort of the topic that we want to start off this podcast with. The idea of adaptations, you know? And good video game to film adaptations. Can we think of any? I mean, obviously, Doom starring uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. One of uh, the best action movies of all time. <laughs> okay, let's be real, though. <laughs> when that movie cuts to first person... I was cheering in the theater. Like I actually, actually kind of cool. I actually stood up and started clapping with other people in the theater. <laughs> Did you see the um, the House of the Dead one? As yes. well? it does the, the first person mode, which is actually actually that movie is kind of cool, and just because it's so cheesy and and like well, B movie aspect. Yeah, it's awesome. Kind of owns it because House of the Dead. I mean, as far as I understand, it was only really an arcade game, right? That, that's my understanding. Yeah, there did has it? there has been some ports. Mm. Okay, so they did port it to console, and um, there was there was a new one. The, there was a new Wii one that was only on the Wii called I want to say Overkill. How's that Overkill? Actually, Overkill is also on PC now, and they've also turned it into the second iteration of uh, Typing Up the Dead. Right. But oh I, no way! Right, yeah. right, but but I mean, it, it wasn't originally an arcade game. So. Yeah, I guess not. So I'm I'm saying it, it actually started. It's, as a it's always been arcade style, but yeah, it's I guess it's, I guess yeah, there have been some games that haven't been like. So they the translated arcade. House of the Dead from an arcade game to a movie to a typing game, kind of. Actually, Typing of the Dead was on the Dreamcast. Really? Yeah. The the first one was, and then I have a copy. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I'm gonna have to teach uh, my kid how to type using typing. It the doesn't dead. really work that way. Like, you probably shouldn't <laughs> because there is a they drop the f bomb constantly. Yeah. Really? It you is. gotta play. If you if you haven't played House of the Overkill, honestly, you'd love it. It's it is, in a typing game. Well, it's well, it's, 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 it's the it, same game as yeah. Overkill, right? It's just it, it was version. Overkill. They just like added a typing layer to it. Essentially. Instead of aiming so your it, gun to shoot yeah. to kill people, you have to type out words to kill yeah. zombies. That's so zombies. weird. It's not um, it's not like Super Mario teaches typing or something like that, where they're oh. actually trying to teach you typing. It's more like it's just a gameplay. A bit. Yeah, it's, it's like how fast can you type? Damn it! All right, I guess I'll stick with Doctor Mario teaches typing. <laughs> and, unless you unless you want all the f bombs, but it, well, just, <laughs> the story plays out like a really cheesy kind of like grind house. Oh movie. yeah, it's, it's, it's very it's like fun. You'd like yeah. it. You'd actually Did, like. Wasn't it. House of the Dead? No, that's House of a Thousand Corpses, the one that Rob Zombie directed. Yeah, that's House of a Thousand Corpses. Yeah. yeah. I like, I like have there, like 50, but you know who's coming? Yeah. Have there been any? Besides Doom, I guess that's pretty mainstream. Yeah. Any mainstream game to movie adaptations? Hitman. Oh yeah, Hitman. With um, I can't believe I'm forgetting his name. He's a great actor. He's also the star of Justified. He was in. Yeah, Deadwood. I know who you're talking about. Um, I immediately would like think Jason Statham, but that's not even remotely correct. No, Jason no. Statham's the guy who played uh, in the Name of a King. Have you seen that movie? The Dungeon Siege movie. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> that's that movie is. Irredeemably bad. Yeah, you can't even watch it and make fun of it. It has nothing to do with Dungeon Siege. (laughs) But also, it's there's nothing good you can say about it. Like if you watch that movie, trying to make fun of it, which I have, you just fall asleep. It is a bad movie. Yeah, man, there are a lot of uh, adaptations out there that just have nothing to do with their source material beyond the name. Like I know it's not a video game, but uh, World War Z. You seen that movie? No. I haven't seen it, but I heard that it was nothing like... The, the book. book was like this really interesting collection of interviews yeah. and journal entries. And the movie, while actually fairly good, was just Brad Pitt running around with a machine gun. No, no. That's kind of why I didn't see it. I actually refused. Once I heard what it was and that it was not going to be like the book, yeah. I checked out immediately. I would love to see a World War Z video game structured like the book, you know? Like, yeah. Like, I mean, I obviously, say. like, The Walking Dead is progressing in that sort of direction, um, in the sense that it's less about shooting zombies in the head and more about, like, interpersonal stories in zombie apocalyptic settings, but something like World War Z translated into an interactive space would be pretty cool. Yeah, what I find interesting, too, about that approach for zombie stories is that that was actually how zombie stories got their start uh, with not, with Night of Living Dead, which was really more about the interpersonal relationships of the characters. And then it kind of morphed into zombies being this, like, bad guy, monster monsterized element where it was all about yeah. just killing them and mowing them down, and it especially <clears> went into <throat> video games like that. Now we've kind of come full, full circle, and we're returning to that element with The Walking Dead. Uh, thanks to its influence in television and comics, really. Well, I wonder, too, you know, um, I I make it no secret that I'm not the biggest fan of The Last of Us. I think it was a good story, and the gameplay was really clean and polished, 
but it wasn't anything revolutionary. You know, I, I'll save that for another time. But, you know, with its adaptation into a movie, and same thing with Warcraft's ad- adaptation into a movie, they're not really adapting any sort of game into a movie. They're adapting the game's narrative into a movie. And that's, like, while that seems obvious, that's an important distinction to make. So it's like, what exactly do we choose to translate into big Hollywood movies? You know, like, do we... Like, do we stick with the Doom thing, where we bring the first-person perspective shooter into the movie, or...? No, I think... I think that you do kind of you have to you have to consider the medium and you have to adapt it accordingly to the the constraints of the medium that you're working in and I think that's actually a problem with some video games because I get the impression that the the developers would rather make have made a movie right um, and I have actually not played Last of Us I don't have a PS3 I have seen Let's Plays I have talked about it a lot with other people that have played it and that's the impression I get with Last of Us yeah Plus, you're not wrong is um, that they would rather just make a movie. Yeah, so we're we're we are distinguishing right now between like transmedia and cross media. So right. transmedia being the thing where we've got different stories and different media, and you're kind of like the, trying to deliver a different aspect of kind of this universe, a different um, sort of like section of the story that's not in the game but can lead into the game. Versus a, a cross media thing where you're actually adapting the game into a film. We're focusing more on that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I don't know if I would draw that distinction between the terminology, really, but well, I mean, that's I mean, fine. The, the main reason I'm asking is, for instance, you know, like Halo 4 had um, Ford Unto Dawn, which was very interesting, I think, like, you know, it's a short series, um, live action that was basically meant to be context, and, like, wasn't important to Halo 4 necessarily, but it explains some of the stuff that went into different characters and a little bit of background um, before the game came out. Yeah. Speaking of which, did you guys see that... Um, the Bungie television studio that was going to produce the Halo show got ripped out? No, uh, no. Yeah, it's, it's done. It's dead. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, really? I heard I heard after they ended the Xbox One um, or the Xbox Live, whatever they're calling it, television service, that they were still going to they were still going to go ahead and make the Halo show, but they decided not to. Well, no, no. I'm talking about just the Xbox streaming version. Like they, like they're not making it part of the Xbox One Media Center anymore. Right, but they're still making it. Right, they're just oh, going to okay. air it on TV. I'm pretty sure, or like on. Netflix. It's probably going to be Netflix. Yeah, I don't know where television station would pick it up. Netflix has been pretty cool for um, adapting new television shows and premiering new series in lieu of television networks. Yeah, and whatnot. Hulu's trying to kind of do that as well. Amazon, huh. Amazon's doing it too. Not not as successful. I don't think. I, I think. Huh. Yeah. I, I, I just as an aside, I think Hulu, um, like, I don't know, I guess maybe it's more popular than I would think, but it kind of bugs me that you pay for their service and they still give you ads. It's like, well, I'm, I'm almost paying. I don't pay. <laughs> I don't know what this you well, business if, is. If you were to pay, I guess is what I'm saying. But, like, there are some shows that you can only get if you are a Hulu Plus member, which is why I guess some people would indulge them and go out and pay for a monthly subscription. But are any of them worth a damn? Probably not. And that's why I haven't done it. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know, the ability to host this kind of stuff is just, it's really awesome. Like the, the Halo show in particular, I'm pretty sure it's airing this fall. I think it's slated to come out before 2015. Huh. Um, are you guys big into the Halo universe? Not huge. I mean, I really enjoyed the first three games. Really? Yeah. I, I just could never get into them, honestly. For me, um, Starters, the gameplay, I'm, I'm so much more accustomed to the PC FPS. I never really got into the... Oh, yeah, FPS. for sure. The gameplay... But, it, I mean, that, the whole, like, regenerating shield aspect, I really yeah. didn't like. But plus, the the world just came off as so generic to me that I just could never really get into See, it. See, I don't know. Like, I agree with you on the gameplay. I am I was not a huge Halo fan. I hated the multiplayer, the really intense shields that could absorb an entire clip of bullets from a, you know, a machine gun is... Too much for me, you know. I just didn't really care for that much. Uh, but with the world building, I actually thought it was pretty creative. Yeah, I mean, I um, I read a couple of the books actually, some of the earlier ones. Yeah, I I stopped following it kind of like you after three, um, and then I sort of had vicariously through a few friends hearing about like you know ODST and four and that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, really, like it was the first three games plus the uh, the books, and the world building is pretty interesting, I think, because it's meant to be. Um, I, I always like this kind of setting, kind of a future, our Earth, 
you know, it's not just kind of like, you know, generic sci-fi. It's like what happens to humanity in however many hundreds of years. Yeah, that's why I was really interested to see that one movie. What is it? Um, Edge of Edge of Tomorrow or Edge of Extinction? Edge of Tomorrow. Edge of Tomorrow, tomorrow yeah. It's basically Groundhog Day with sci-fi guns. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I haven't seen it. But it looks <laughs> interesting. But Bill, was, Bill Murray would have beat that movie. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and there's like Tom Cruise's Oblivion. You know, mm-hmm. I kind of feel like that's what Halo was going for with the fantasy sort of sci-fi added to it. Yeah. You know? yeah. Elysium also kind of had similar... <laughs> I, I, Let's not talk about Elysium right now. <laughs> not to say, I'm not suggesting it was a good movie. I just meant it had a similar aesthetic. For sure. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. When it comes to turning an established game world into a movie, and I think that's what's important is the game world, not yeah. just the game. Like, play a contained game narrative. Because really, what kind of benefit do you gain from translating an interactive a to B narrative into a movie, you know? I personally would say none, yeah. which is why I'm kind of against the concept itself. Exactly. I think it makes more sense if you're taking aspects of that of that world that you find interesting and making an original story Absolutely. for the characters. That's why, like, um, with The Last of Us thing, I'm not really excited at all because I think it's this, the same exact thing as the game, just with even less agency. But with the Warcraft movie... Like, this first one that they're making is mm-hmm. just the origin story of the orcs and the humans. Oh, you know? Okay, cool. Yeah, that's from what I understand, it's supposed to be a movie that gets people into the world who, ha- who oh, aren't okay. already there. And who haven't played Warcraft 1. Right. It's, a, it's essentially supposed to just be telling the origin story of the conflict between the humans and the orcs, which then became the Alliance and the Horde and stuff like that. And that's really cool. Uh, but, you know, what I want to see, if the movie's successful and they make more is all of this Warcraft lore that they still haven't explored in the game. You know? Yeah. Like, for those who aren't familiar with World of Warcraft, the timeline for that game, they have written in, like, twenty to 30,000 years of history. Yeah. Technically, 100,000 if you read some of the other stuff, but there's huge gaps. Yeah, yeah. But my point is they have all of this history, and then World of Warcraft takes up, like, 10 years of that timeline. Mm-hmm. And it's all just going forward. There's never going back until the new expansion now, Warlords of Draenor, which mm-hmm. is going to go back in time into an alternate universe. Oh, I didn't even hear yeah, that. Yeah, really. So you travel through some sort of portal. like Yeah, back yeah essentially they rip time open and you go back before the orcs were um, like freed from the blood rage, I think it is, the, the demon blood of Manoroth. Mm. But, you know, suffice it to say, what I want to see is some of these old stories that Blizzard can't really adapt into the MMO because it would be too scatterbrained into a movie. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. One of the things that we've never seen in Warcraft are some of the big, notorious names like uh, Queen As- Ashara. Have you guys, you, you, Jim, you've played WoW a lot, right? Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever play WoW, Chris? I did. Um, I stopped playing after um, uh, Cataclysm. So, Queen Ashara is like one of. The, Ashara itself is this land north of Orgrimmar, the Horde capital city. Yeah. It's huge. There are two separate world boss encounters that happen there. And tons of questing and tons of environment design. That's where you go find the Hydraxian Waterlords to unlock bosses in Molten Core. It's this yeah. really deep zone. But beyond what the player does there, there's nothing really there narratively. Despite the fact that that's the place in the world that created WoW as we now know it, with like the maelstrom in the middle Mm -hmm. of the ocean, Mm -hmm. because that's where Queen Ashara and her high elves blew up the Well of Eternity, and they summoned Sargeras and the Burning, etc. We've never seen that Mm -hmm. in WoW. Yeah, not in WoW. I think they've mentioned it in like books or something. For sure, yeah. Yeah. There was the Well of Eternity series in the books. But like, you know, stuff like that, stuff that we, that's so critically important to WoW's world, but we haven't seen adapted into a movie. And so that's something that I wish we could see with The Last of Us. And hey, we don't know if they're not doing this, you know. Um, Instead of just showing the plot of The Last of Us, why not show a different perspective of the outbreak? Yeah, you know? I agree. Or like, I agree. You know how in The Last of Us, I know that you guys haven't played it a whole lot, um, but I saw Let's Play. It's almost the same thing. It's I don't know. I actually really like Let's Play. <laughs> but with now in the new age, they have this like totalitarian government sort of thing. It's like really like martial law is like almost always in effect. It's really crazy. I would love to see a movie about how that came about, you know? Mm. Other characters, or, or like a Fireflies movie. Fire, the Fireflies are the, the 
outlaw group yeah. in The Last of Us. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Basically, you're making an argument for trans media rather than just pure adaptation. Right. Yeah. I don't think. I think you lose something when you. You do. Yeah. So now I know that there are a lot of media purists out there who would probably crucify me for saying this, but I think you lose something by translating an interactive narrative to the screen. Mm-hmm. But you do have the potential to gain something by taking a film and bringing it into the interactive space. I would agree. I in would, in principle, um, it just usually isn't executed very well sure. in practice. I would say it depends on what you're saying. Are you, if you're talking about the game world and you're, you're adapting it, you're not adapting the film itself. You're trying to put, um, you reuse the characters inside like a different space. For example, um, the Chronicles of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay Game exactly. was excellent. But it didn't try to adapt either Pitch Black or Final Celebrity. Right. Like, However, when you do the when you're when you're actually trying to take a game a, a, a film itself and then make the game story into a game or the the film story into a game, you really do lose. Oh God! Yeah. Like like, like, like any, the Wolverine game. Yeah. Any like licensed video game that's based on a film, especially if it comes out before the film, um, and it's just basically rehashing events in the film, but like adding like two hundred times more bad guys. Yeah. It's yeah, like, it's usually what happens. It, 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 it's just it's horrible. It doesn't for sure. Yeah. yeah, because that's you're not actually experiencing the narrative in any unique way. You're just ruining all of the cinematography and plot pacing and everything that happened in the exactly. movie. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like you just throw cinematography out the door when you just adapt a movie to games. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you think about? Um, well, let's not forget though about the all-time classic Bugs Life. Right, where they wow. have like all the, uh, the yeah. berry collecting yeah. and all that fun stuff. Because you have to have quests, in yeah, games, of course, <laughs> yeah, collectibles. But, but what do you think about the when you take a um, a game and you adapt it in a very creative and different way to a film? A game and you adapt it. What do you mean? You adapt it and you adapt the world and you change it around to be markedly different from the game itself, and so the film oh, becomes so. almost a re a reimagining of the experience, and of course. The specific example I'm talking about here is one of the greatest uh, adaptations of all time, Super Mario Bros. The movie. Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> yeah, so that, um, like, not being sarcastic at all, oh, that movie was the shit. I liked it. I liked like, the movie. I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, it may have been the low point of those actors' careers, but for me, really? that movie was just wonderful. Did, did John Leguizamo have a high point of his career? Uh, Think about it for a second. Well... I mean, I don't want to say too much bad about him because he's like my wife's childhood crush. But oh, really? Yeah. J leg. Yeah, like it's J leg. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I get what you're saying, you know. And so when you're talking about these adaptations that just take, in the last podcast we talked about um, caricatures instead of characters. Yes. And adapting that into a re- in a reimagined way to the the silver screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that's cool. I love that. I love when movies do that. That's like with Doom. With Doom, there was no real Doom narrative. Like, there was a little bit there, but it was mostly, like, environmental narrative and, like, the feel of the game. And they added and fleshed out characters. They gave it a narrative arc. And, I mean, the movie sucked, you know, but that, but that doesn't matter. Right. What matters was, like, how they adapted, you know, and it was, I don't know, I really liked it. I, I liked that they revamped a lot of the stuff and played with what they could do on a film screen. So you liked the Doom film, actually. I liked the experience of it. I didn't like the movie itself. Okay. I, I, I'll, I'll agree with you on that point, yeah. because I did think there was, especially like the first person part, some of it was interesting. Otherwise, it was a pretty generic action. Oh, yeah. It was just a generic, you know, big, muscly guys with big guns that shoot stuff. But, but some of those are great. And and sometimes so, that's all you really, like, want to have in a movie. Yeah, it was a like, fun experience. Yeah. You know, like, I didn't, I left my brain in the door, and I, I enjoyed the movie, and it was cool seeing it in first person, and, you know, it was fun. But that was all I needed it to be. Mm-hmm. Whereas with, if they were to adapt Azeroth from WoW or The Last of Us yeah. into the screen, I'm going to need to bring my brain into the movie. Right, like, yeah. for, exactly. If, if they're going to adapt Molten Core Dungeon Run. Oh. To the to the to, to no. the silver screen, not even the dungeon run of Molten. Well, I would watch. I'm more, I'm more interested in the Nixia the film. Yeah, you know, 50 BKP minus. <laughs> yeah, uh, Nixia. Oh, but see, that one's a lot. That'd be a lot shorter. See, that'd be like a mini series. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it'd be pretty short. See, with with Molten Core, you have to go through the whole dungeon. Man, you could have like a three part mini series on HBO where like the first part is them getting attuned to yeah. the dungeon, oh, and then yes, <laughs> yes, mage is passing out like water this. and everything. Yeah, yeah. No. it could be a trilogy. <laughs> yeah, the new Lord of the Rings. But yeah, I mean. 
I would probably watch that ten times, but no, you're, you're <laughs> right. You're right. That wouldn't work out. But. The epic of Leroy Jenkins, the movie. Speaking of, um, you know, the whole, like, episodic interpretation of, you know, a single, I don't know, like, the, the Inixia experience being translated into three episodes, um, I think now's a good time to transition into what we want to talk about, uh, sort of for, like, the main media discussion that you guys love to listen to, <laughs> all, all four of you. <laughs> uh, we for listening. <laughs> We recently got together and played um, The Wolf Among Us, which is the new Telltale series. And we don't want to talk about the wolf, the or the Wolf Among Us on this podcast because we don't want to just have a whole bunch of spoilers and ruin the discussion. Uh, but we we played it for a roundtable mm-hmm. that we'll be dropping about next week, probably about Friday or Saturday. That's about right. Yeah. And um, uh, we sort of had a, a, an ancillary conversation about the episodic game structure uh, and what it would have been like to wait for these episodes to drop a month at a time. Uh, I spent a lot of time writing on this concept. I uh, wrote on The Walking Dead and sort of the episodic formula, what uh, Dan Connors and Kevin Bruner, the guys at Telltale, call appointment gaming. You know how you have the concept of appointment television where it's like every Saturday at 7 is when Game of Thrones comes out, or I think it's Sunday. Sunday, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, so you have that appointment on your calendar. And the, the same concept, bringing that into the mm-hmm. gaming world. It's, it's interesting that they're talking about bringing it into the game world as we're losing it in the TV space. Yeah. Because so many people are using their DVRs, and we've gotten accustomed to not really needing to be there when the show is actually on. So a lot of people don't watch things live anymore. Yeah. And yeah. don't really worry about missing it, because they know they've got it on their party recorded. Yeah. And then you've also got, uh, we talked about, in, in relation to that, the concept of trailers and teasers and um, the wait for a new game yeah. to come out. And sometimes when they, they'll do teasers up for games two years in advance, two and a half years in advance, they'll they'll put out, um, I know for Wind Waker, uh, originally, the original, some of the original designs for New Zelda before it even had a name, were using a very realistic art style. And then when they actually started developing the game and they had a real teaser for it, people were kind of shocked when all of a sudden the art style was um, very cartoonish. Well, to be fair, I think that first one you were talking about was just more of a tech demo. No, but they presented it as a teaser for Legend of Zelda. They said the new new Legend of Zelda coming to the GameCube. Hmm. They, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't confirm anything, to be fair, hmm. but they definitely let people think that was what the game I, was going I, I to suppose be. so. But I mean, and then I, they I, eventually got it in Twilight Princess. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I, I loved Wind Waker. I'm not knocking Wind Waker's no, sure, style. Sure. I'm just saying that they certainly in, they certainly were trying to drum up hype for the new Legend of Zelda by, oh, yeah. Yeah. with that video. And, of course, they probably had, didn't have the art style planned out anyway. Well, it's, it's a lot like, though, actually, when the Wii U was first announced and they had that little tech demo for the Legend of Zelda. Everybody was thinking that was going to be the thing, and now we've got the new one that's actually been announced, and it's, you know, alternated and everything like mm-hmm. that. So I don't, I don't really, th- like, I didn't take that as being... Um, like, this is the new Legend of Zelda. It's just like, what might Zelda look like on the spot? Sure. But then, I mean, this really relates to the, sort of the first conversation we had where, think of, like, the teaser trailer for Skyrim. You know, it was live action. And it was, like, all you could see was, like, a town was on fire, and a guy in a horned helmet walked down a burning street, and there was a dragon, and he was like, yeah. ah! Yeah. And then the trailer was over. <laughs> and so it's like, what does this adaptation of a game's aesthetic feeling into a trailer, how does that get our anticipation up? And then how does the game deliver on that? Because they communicate things entirely different ways, which is why I think nowadays with trailers, we've been seeing a lot more of actual gameplay in trailers instead of just cinematics. I I think people are kind of... um a bit jaded by some of like you know false ex- expectations, um, either from live action trailers or from you know Zelda, whether or not that was Nintendo's fault. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot now, more and more now, people want to see gameplay. I think also also some of that is a bit of a kickback from uh, Kickstarter. Um, yeah, people I definitely making, agree. making these huge promises um, and then like not delivering. So what they're saying yeah. is like, hey, what you're seeing is actual gameplay. Like not we we have That's some nice things thing and we're working on it. That's <laughs> definitely. Um, you know, the, the concept of we want to see what you're talking about, right. not, you know, we want to see pretty animated sequences of people fighting and mm. then we'll find out what the gameplay is on launch day. Right. You know, that's not even remotely what we want anymore. And it almost seems like now there's a stigma mm. when at E3, 
if all we see are videos, people are like, what is this crap? Yeah, Which like we, we did, and that was yeah, the reaction we saw. No gameplay. Yeah. To both Sony and Microsoft yeah. uh, were, especially Sony, I think was actually worse about it, but both Microsoft was pretty good. Yeah, all we well. saw were just like animated renderings. We saw videos and movies and I didn't get actual, about that. actual advertisements for movies yeah. at E3, you know? Which, I mean, it's the Electronic Entertainment Expo, so that's fine, that's fine. But still... We saw very little gameplay, and that caused people to get really pissed at Sony and Microsoft, whereas Nintendo, they showed almost exclusively in-game uh, action. And like Even the Zelda reveal, they were yeah, like, by the way, rendered. this is in-game. This yeah. isn't pre-rendered. And we were like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so that's sort of the, uh, the topic that we're going to delve into now is uh, both... The idea of anticipation, translation, and how we how we uh, respond to waiting for things that come out when they've both been experienced in the gameplay realm and when they've been experienced via a trailer. You know? Yeah, and I would say the sort of tension that, that you get, like how much, what is the optimal weight that you can put between, say, an episode of an, ep- an episode of game series like Wolf Among Us or Walking Dead to the because if you wait too long, eventually people are going to stop caring. Well, yeah. And if but if, if you if you don't wait long enough, if you don't have that tension, when they when they whenever they release a new um, television series and they're giving you that week long wait before the new episode, it's supposed to build you up and make you anticipate and want to you know wonder about what's going on. And finally, when it releases, it gives you that satisfaction. Yeah. Whereas if they were if they waited and they kept delaying the episode for like a year, sort of like. Uh, Breaking Bad, when they split the final season in two, oh god, yeah, it was an almost. A, I think it was almost a year break, it was almost a year, and it really killed the momentum for that season. I still haven't gone back and watched it again, I, and I do kind of plan to because I think I'll it'll be better received when you actually put them both together. I agree, and I think there are two really good examples of this from both realms, and one is um, uh, Kentucky Route Zero. Me. Have you guys played that one? Uh, I'm working on Act 3 right now. Yeah. I haven't played it. The, see, the thing is, is it's an episodic game. It was intended to be, at least, released in five different acts. And it was supposed to drop one episode every month or two. Mm-hmm. And it actually dropped one episode a year. Yeah. And uh, Oh, wow. Yeah. It, I played the first one, and the first act of Kentucky Route Zero was phenomenal. It blew me away. It was so good. See, I actually wasn't that impressed by it. I loved it. I loved it. Mm. But see, the thing is, even though I loved it as much as I did, I had to wait so long yeah. with no word from the developers, with no mm. teasers, with no with no dramatic tension. Are you guys still alive? <laughs> yeah, that, that when they dropped the second episode, it came out, and I didn't even realize it until a month later when some of our college friends were posting on Facebook about it. It's like, yeah. oh, that dropped? What happened in the last episode? You know? <laughs> what, 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 where, where were we? Then on the, uh, real quick, on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have binge-watching, mm-hmm. and we've got Orange is the New Black. We were waiting for, at least, I don't know if you guys are into that show, but my wife and I were waiting for... I'm aware of it. I, I was more into House of Hearts. I love House of I didn't really it. like. I, I, I gave Orange is the New Black a chance, but it really wasn't for yeah. me. As a side note, without giving you any chance to respond, I think House of Cards is overrated. Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> hey! Hey! But with Orange is the New Black, we As waited... As a side note, you're wrong. <laughs> we waited for that second season to drop for what felt like forever. And then all the episodes came out, and we watched them in three days. Yeah. And we were like, oh, now it's over. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And while it's partially satisfying to be able to watch it all, and you don't have to wait, yeah! Yeah! Then when it's over, it's like, oh, it went by in three days instead of over the course of four months. Yeah, yeah. and I think what you're missing there, too, is um, whenever, at least it's the way I am when I watch television shows, um, particularly ones that have a continuing narrative, um, you want to have that sort of at least like a day break between the episodes so that you can kind of think about and, and better digest what you've just seen so that you can prepare yourself for the next episode. When you start binge-watching in this I, I'm guilty of it too because I, I don't I don't like the wait, but I realize I don't have I recognize I don't have as good of an experience with it because everything starts blending together and I start to forget moments that really I should shouldn't even forget because I had just seen it maybe in the previous episode, but they do, I don't I don't have that moment of 
I don't know, like reflection on those moments. Well, so, you know, that's, um, with binge watching, <laughs> do you ever stop yourself from binge watching? I have, I have. Have yeah. you? I, I have to. I mean, I have to force myself. It's hard. Yeah, see, I wonder if there's some merit to, um, you know, because when I watch something, you know, I love the term, like, you know, like the new buzzword is the water cooler uh, aspect of oh, yeah. shows, you know? Yeah, that's been around for a while. Right, but it's they've recently brought it back, mm-hmm. especially with gaming episodic content, like with The Walking Dead. Like, sure. they say, actually, I should say, um, Telltale are the ones who really tried to bring it back. And then in Microsoft's press conference last year, all they said was water cooler, like 20 times, you know? But so anyway... <laughs> was that also the one where it was all about TV, though? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. So. But so it's like um, the concept of watching something and then at the water cooler at work the next day, you're talking to all your coworkers like, did you see last night's episode of whatever, whatever? Uh, and it's supposed to be the same anticipation of, did you play the recent episode of The Walking Dead? What yeah. did you do? What happened for you? Yeah. But then when you binge watch it, you don't really get that experience. Mm-hmm. So you just lose part of it. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if it's a bad thing to let people binge watch. I don't think it's inherently bad. I think different people have different preferences. And in a way, I guess you are missing a bit of that sort of social aspect to it. But I tend to binge watch stuff that's been like well, well passed off the air. Like I didn't see any of Breaking Bad until after the second season or the final season had ended. And then I went back and just like watched the entire season or entire series, so I could actually like get what people are talking about. And at that point, I was like, oh, okay, I get everything now. So I, I sort of like, in a way, I still had the water cooler, even though I wasn't actually participating in that conversation. But if then that makes you, sense. yeah, I mean, I, I've done that with a lot of shows too. Like for example, um, I I was a big fan of Battlestar Galactica, but I didn't actually watch it when it was on the air. I actually watched it afterward and became a fan then. Um, but I do think that I that I missed having that um, anticipation every week for the new episode to come out. Sure, you, you don't have that giant wait between seasons, mm-hmm. which I, I do, that does disappoint me, but I kind of <clears> would <throat> like, uh, especially these new Netflix series, for them to give you a week, uh, at least about a week at least, at least a few days and between episodes yeah. so that you can you can digest it and talk about it, and you can have these forum discussions where you where you can talk about the episode as opposed to some people have seen all of it and some have only seen one episode. I think though that's just kind of Netflix trying to embrace their their binge brand, if you will. Like, a, they know that everyone who uses Netflix is a binger and they want to just like, hey, hey guys, now you don't even have to wait. Like we're gonna release this thing and it's all there. Enjoy. You know? Yeah, and you know, it's it's a weird kind of topic to broach because it's um you don't want to say no, Netflix, you shouldn't let, give it all to us. We don't have the willpower to not <laughs> hit next episode. Yeah. Because if I'll you want to admit that, <laughs> if, if you want to binge watch something, that's awesome. Go yeah, for it, yeah. you know? And like you said, if you've already missed everything, mm. then yeah, I don't want to wait a week between Breaking Bad episodes and then a year between seasons. Yeah. You know? No, I, yeah, I think the week is a bit much, especially when it's already out, but at least a day, at least, at least a day to. Digest it, and the same thing with the with getting back into the game element of it too. With Wolf Among Us, the way that I tried to play it, and I think I only didn't between episode two and three, but I tried to give myself about a day to sort of digest the episode before I went on to the next one. I, I only actually yeah. could get one episode in a day, um, and then I had kind of a more free time on Thursday, so I did four and five back to back. See, I really wish that uh, this is something that we didn't do for our playthrough. But we didn't really talk to each other between episodes. And that was you know? partially because some of you guys were behind. Yeah. So like, I, I, I wanted to talk about, say, like, one and two and stuff yeah. like that. But then I didn't want to spoil anything for you guys. Yeah. So, and, like, you know, it might have been interesting if we did sort of, like, set ourselves all to a schedule and say, you know, by the end of today, let's all have one finished and then we can talk about it the next day. Yeah. But then, like, uh, on the way to this podcast, Jim and I were talking about our decisions and it was really fun to be like, Oh, did this happen for you? And wait, you didn't do that? Then how did this scene? Oh, wait, you didn't have that scene? What? And, and yeah. it was really yeah. fun. That's like when the first season of The Walking Dead game first came out. And, uh, you know, there were a bunch of people here at our university that were playing through it. And we'd come, I'd come to class the next day and we'd talk about it. And it's like, oh my God, we have to wait a month. Mm-hmm. But wait, you killed that person? Oh my God. You know, <laughs> like I'm, I'm assuming the walking dead is far enough gone that we can have spoilers for that. Season right? one. For season yeah. one. For season, yeah. one. For season yeah. one. Yeah. I haven't played two yet. Actually. That's like yeah. when, uh, when, uh, 
oh man, I can't actually remember her name. Uh, when Carly or Doug is shot in the head by yeah. um, Lily. Lily, that's her name. Lily. Yeah. yeah. I and couldn't, I couldn't whichever name. one of them survived, she just shoots. It was like, whoa, yeah. whoa, stop. You and know? That was one of those things I actually replayed trying to avert that particular occurrence. Yeah. And then he realized, like, oh, someone's going to die every time. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's always going to be one of those two because yeah. they don't want to actually create. Uh, dialogue for both of those characters to be entirely. Yeah, that's what I was kind of hoping to like. Stay alive. You know, this is this is you know sort of. I mean, this is I guess an argument that we could have about these episodic games. It's like because they are so short, I almost want them to feel like they are more open than anything else. So I understand. Yeah, right. um, I understand that there is um, development time that goes into it, and because they're trying to release one a month, they need to act very quickly and get a lot of stuff done in the quick manner. I almost wish, though, that they would take a lot more sort of, like, front-loaded time, develop most of the episodes, and then, um, I mean, this would take away from their ability to adapt based on people's, um, like, the percentages that they yeah. collect about, like, who did what. Um, but it'd be really nice to see it be more open-ended. And well, see, more. I think that's just part of the design philosophy that they've been improving, because I think in The Wolf Among Us, and you guys will get more of this when we release the roundtable, is that that we had that in the Wolf Among Us. I felt all the way through, like, my decisions, I was playing my Big B. Especially since, you know, we talked beforehand and we found out what kind of character we wanted to play. Yeah, right. And I you got were, that same feeling. You yeah. were, like, middle of the road, and Jim was, I was like... middle of the road. Actually, I, I was mostly good. Or you were mostly good. Jim was middle of the road, and I was just the biggest cunt I could possibly yeah. be. I was trying you know? to be the most, like... The noirish detective guy was kind kind of a dick, a little bit of a scoundrel, but also kind of had a soft spot, you know, or like women and children. And, women and, and children. I very and much embraced. Sort of I very much embraced the like this is his redemption thing, right? Because they had they made a big deal out of that in episode one about how like you know your past is not a good one, and you're trying right. to make things different here. And so I was really trying to embrace like I want to be different. Yeah, but I really felt like you were playing him in your own unique way, and they had so many more contextual responses to player choice in this one. And sure. yeah. even, even though, you know, even in our really brief discussion about each other's playthroughs, we can identify that there were a lot of things that were the same regardless, yeah. Yeah. but it was the way they were presented and the con- the context around them that really made me feel like my decisions mattered. Whereas in the walking dead, you could see that there was a choke point in every episode. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Now it's better concealed than Wolf Among Us. Yeah, really was. That being said, you know the anticipation of waiting is really, really weakened when you can see that it's a choke point. You know, mm-hmm. like when when you're talking about like what did you do that was different from what I did? I think that has a lot more of a water cooler element to it because it's it's less of like. I want to get your opinion on what happened in last night's episode of Breaking Bad, and it becomes, I want to know what you did differently, and like, what did I miss out on, and what what can I tell you that you might not know? And that actually goes back a lot to, um, I think, like some of the more old school conversations kids would have, like at school playing a game. It's like, oh, hey, I found this secret in like you know level twelve or something like that. You know, kind of, you know, they had different experiences because one person would find something that someone else didn't. Um, so yeah, I think that is something interesting about interactive gameplays. We all have our own um, experience of the media, um, and then we get to sort of discuss those differences, like you said, for sure. Yeah, and finding finding secrets, like you talked about, is always one of the funnest things that I that I would talk to talk to my friends about. Mm, yeah. Like what What did you find? Did you find this little like you know power up in this one little area? Did you find the the secret warp pipe to you know level seven or what have you? Did you know that um, Samus is a girl? <laughs> <laughs> they, they also had that in um, she's just the a Wolf long, Among long Us. Long hair rock band, <laughs> hair metal band, people from the 80s. They also had that in the Wolf Among Us through the Book of Fables thing, where you got to unlock the little like um, uh, encyclopedia entries for everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I still don't have quite a few of them because of the choices I, I made. I, too. Yeah, yeah, I didn't encounter some of those, so I, it's like I bet you can't unlock all of them in one playthrough. Maybe not. Well, what looked interesting to me actually is I I did a little bit of a second playthrough, like I mentioned to you guys. Um, like very, like I, I just got to the first sort of like you know um, title sequence. So basically, just the first major scene of the first episode. Um, but I noticed when I was trying to get that set up that um, in the current save file I have, you can actually rewind not just to different episodes but also to different chapters. So you can oh. actually you can actually go back to like you know the beginning of chapter three in episode one, and you can skip over a little bit. Really? Yeah. 
Interesting. Kind of cool. Now, I haven't tried it out, so I don't know exactly how it works, but that's kind of the impression I got. Okay. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, see, this this concept of... Um, this, this goes back to the difference between a trailer that has just cinematic trailers and gameplay trailers, because they're so much different in the relation of static content towards like interactive mutable content and so we've got like both the fact that we can make unique choices and we can talk about how our experience was colored differently whether we played big b in this way versus that way but then there's also the, another layer of you know well what am i not seeing up front you know when it's just a cinematic trailer and you're seeing something up front you kind of have to take it at face value yeah whereas in games and you have the ability to explore and interact it's like okay what if, what have i not been shown what yeah. do i still have to find because you're only seeing what that one person that's playing it what they're experiencing and you know hey if i was there you know, maybe I wouldn't jump up to that platform. Maybe I'd go see what the you know lower path is. Mm-hmm. What that what that has as well. And this kind of raises an interesting point for me too. That goes a little bit back away. You know, we were sort of talking about is there kind of an ideal time between um, you know releases that gives us time to sort of digest it and talk about it. And I think a lot of that has to do one with the medium and two with the length of the episode. Like with TV. You know, it's either 30 minute episodes a week or it's one hour episodes a week. Yeah. Um, but it's a very, it's a relatively short time commitment in your day. Um, and then you like wait a week and you have a relatively short time commitment again. Whereas with episodic games like the, the Walking Dead, The Wolf Among Us, that tends to be usually a good two, three hour sit down. About two and a half hours, yeah, yeah. I think. Um, but it's also um, potentially extended with replays. Yeah. Um, so if you only have one episode at a time, you might actually go back and try like all the different branches at once. Yeah. Um, so that gives you know, like the, the month in between um, also gives people time to experience it again themselves, but also to discuss a more intricate, more um, uh, more complex you know thing like finding secrets, seeing how things were different um, mm-hmm. versus everyone getting the same thing in one quick sitting, talking about it real quick, and then we get another one very shortly thereafter. See, um, what I found really interesting about my playthrough was that because I was intentionally like a really big hard ass and you know, I didn't let anything slide. At the end of each episode, all of my decisions were on the really low percentage. Like, at one of them, I was in the 2%. And then in another one, I was in the 10% and the 8%. And then after I scrolled down my choices, it was like, come join the discussion at telltalegames.com slash wolf among us, you know? So if we had played this while it was live, and finished the episode right after it launched, and then gone to the forums and started threads about my experience and what do you guys think is happening and right. who do you think did this and that and yeah. stuff like that. Like, let's try to avoid spoilers, but you know. Sure. Um, I got a little involved in that with Walking Dead. Did you? Season one, yeah. And it was pretty, I thought it was pretty interesting because, especially some of the direction that people thought the story would go was so markedly different from the way it actually went. So it was kind of cool. I didn't start until, I want to say it was. The third was when I, because I didn't play it right when it came out. I think I started up when the third episode was out. But then after there, I started following the discussions. See, and that's what I think is really cool. You know, we're not on the Telltale development staff, so we don't know what exactly they do in what they call their live development process. Yeah. But, I mean, they've given speeches at, you know, the Dice Keynote and stuff like that where they say, that they track this stuff to a T and they do their very best to respond to their audiences. So you've got like um, in the first season, when you go to the cannibals farm Mm -hmm. uh, and you have the option to kill the cannibals, you know, to get revenge for what they did to you guys. And they said that in their data that they gathered and in researching like people's reactions on YouTube and stuff like that, they said that, people who chose to kill the cannibals and then the camera cuts over to the little girl yeah. Clementine. They said that the players felt like ashamed that this little girl like watched them do that. Yeah. Cause you know, the, yeah, that was my experience. Right. Because yeah. you know, Lee is supposed to be your avatar in the game world and you are supposed to be looking after Clementine and protecting her. Sarah, right? father. Right. Exactly. And so that's like, um, what exactly are, can we do now? to take audience response and further ingrain that into the next couple episodes. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how much of their vision changed Mm -hmm. in the next three episodes. There's actually another interesting story along those same lines. Um, What was the name of the character? I think it was Ben. 
who was the high school kid that you found in the woods. In yeah. Episode, too, oh, God. Um, <laughs> who kept, like, messing up and getting people killed. Yeah, and yeah. Stuff, so, being, so, like, and that, that's exactly, like, the, the point of the story is that, you know, they put him in there because they expected it to be kind of, like, typical zombie survival conundrum. When you have someone who's weighing down your group, do you treat him well? Do you treat him badly? Like, you know, do you try to sort of protect him or do you sort of go with the purely survivalist utilitarian? Like, this guy's going to drag us down. We can't have him here. Um, but they found that overwhelmingly people decided to be nice to him and to let him stick around, which is probably not what they were expecting. Right. So they said based on that data, they went back and made it so that he would do some more stuff that would make him seem not as sympathetic. Um, and then when later on there was a decision to, like, you know, save him or not, it might be a little bit more difficult. So that is one way that they've actually said that For they sure. changed everything. And that was a shocking thing to me, too, is, um, you know, a lot of times gamers get the rap of being really unsympathetic. And, you know, but when I was playing through The Wolf Among Us, you know, without any spoilers here, a lot of the percentages of choices, mm -hmm. like I said, I played the hard ass and yeah. I was in the vast minority. Yeah. Like, it, it makes it hard, especially when, um, you know, you have people that, your character is supposed to connect with. They do a good job of making you feel that connection. So yeah, yeah. you don't really want to treat them like shit. <laughs> and there are people that come to you for help. And you and I can and you might, maybe you had a hard time selecting some of those options if they're coming to you for help. Even in my hard ass playthrough, there were some moments where I was like, oh man, I don't want to watch this play yeah. out if I do the bad guy yeah. option. Like, well, I also found myself like several times finding myself regretting decisions. Yeah. Like, Oh, I wish I hadn't have said that, but I never reloaded. No, me neither. Yeah, same here. Same. Yeah, I, I felt the same way. Decisions. Although yeah. I will admit that I definitely had some opportunities to be a real hard ass. And when I did, I actually got a lot of satisfaction from it. And I think maybe it was because the way I was playing, I was a real hard ass, but in situations that were somewhat justifiable, Right, like I, you stuck to the letter of the law. Yeah, I never, I never came right out and you know was a complete dick. For the right, it's not like a dick. I'm, I'm doing this because fuck you guys. I'm doing this because it's the law. Right, or, or actually, it was partially. I'm doing this because you disrespected someone that I like, or you disrespected me, disrespected the position. So it's kind of like um, I'm playing this character as though he has a very set morality even though so sometimes he's going to act in a certain way he's going to be more forgiving and merciful and other times he's going to be a real jackass <laughs> right. and I, I think another credit to um telltale's uh active development is you notice that at least in my experience there were sometimes it was very clearly like you know 98.5 percent of people made this choice but then i noticed there was a lot more lopsidedness in the earlier episodes and less in the end episodes a lot more stuff seemed to be in like you know 50 50 40 60 sort of ratio toward the end which I think reflects, you know, their ability to see trends and then adjust things to, like, that they'll know will make people be more split. So with all that in mind, you know, part of this discussion is talking about anticipation and waiting and uh, both episodic design and um, what that does for how we consume narrative. So then what would you say the um, ideal amount of time is between episodic episodes, like episodic episodes, mm -hmm. um, episodic content? You know, because right now it's a month, which, you know, or a month to five weeks. Sometimes it takes an extra week. Yeah. You know, and it's like, well, if they're obviously responding to audience feedback and they did that with the Ben character and they're making these changes and they need a month to do that. But do they need a month, though? Because I'm not so sure they do. I mean, if they, if they already have the main, like they already have most of the narrative, well, all the main choices already kind of mapped out. And they already have a good understanding of where they're going. And, they, and all they're really doing is making these slight adjustments to the way that it's presented to the audience. Do they actually need a full month? I mean, I'm not so sure they that do. That I don't know. You know, I, I really can't say. Because I do think that a month is too, is too long. And I think, too, that like a lot of their changes do come like maybe two or three episodes down the line and not the next episode. I will say that. that, that that's also true. Yeah. I, I, I will I, say I, that a whole month is too long for me in the sense that I want to get back to the narrative. Sure. You know? Yeah. So in that sense, a month is too long. I think it should but be a week. In terms of how accepting I am of it, I'm okay with a month. I think my ideal amount would be two weeks. Two I, weeks? I'd say one or two weeks, yeah. Um, and that's assuming I am following it. Like this game was another one again where I was totally out of it the entire time it was actually coming out iteratively. And I just saw, like, oh, hey, so five is done. I should go ahead and play this. That was kind of our justification for doing this roundtable and talking about it now is we saw that the finale dropped. And, and, you know, I love 
telltale. Like, yeah, I flew to Oxford University to talk about The Walking Dead, and I still hadn't played The Wolf Among Us. So yeah, it's like, yeah. okay, we're playing this now, and we're talking about it. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, if I wasn't willing to play it every month, if I wasn't willing to play an episode every five weeks, then is it working? Yeah, that was the experience that I had, too. For example, I haven't played, I really enjoyed the first season of Walking Dead. And I haven't even started this new one because I'm just too sick of the, I was too sick of the month long break. So I'm just waiting for them to come out. And yeah. then I plan to sort of impose my own weight of at least a day um, so that I can still digest it. But I don't want to wait a full month each time. I, I really do think that, I really do think that they're actually kind of doing themselves a disservice by waiting quite so long yeah between the, between because you know i was looking at it uh when we went to play and the finale dropped three or four days before we started playing mm -hmm. and i checked the steam stats and while i was finishing I it there were 950 people playing the wolf among us a less than a thousand and like the walking dead was it won over 80 game of the year awards and like it and I think that's brand name recognition mainly. Um, I, I, I actually I saw The Wolf Among Us on Steam at one point, and then I realized it was Telltale. But um, like I, I didn't because I didn't know what it was, and like I read up on it, I was like, oh okay, it's based on a comic and all that sort of stuff. But I just don't think it has the same name recognition as The Walking Dead, and a lot of people hopped on that because it was already kind of a phenomenon. Yeah, and, yeah, I suppose that's definitely a like, big part of it. I'll, but... I'll be interested to see what happens when they do uh, Game of Thrones. Yeah, um, it's because just, there's probably going to be a ton of people hopping in on that. I think one of the things that kind of the reason why people are hopping onto those, I'm kind of hate to say it, is because of the television adaptations. Exactly. The Walking Dead was a comic book, of course. Sure. Yeah. The first, and Fable is also a comic book, and yeah. of course, Game of Thrones is a series of novels. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I think the reason why there's going to be there's more fervor behind Walking Dead, and why there will be more fervor behind Game of Thrones, is because of their TV adaptations, mm -hmm. not so much from their original source material, which is kind of. A little unfair, especially since um, I know Fables, and I have actually not read the Fables comic, but I know that it's gotten a lot of um, acclaim and, and won some awards for you know actually being a very a very good comic. Mm -hmm. But it's not as well known as these other properties, and that's mainly because I think comics, like while they are still big, they're not as big. It's a niche market. It, it, it is. Yeah. I mean, it really is. And so television is very much like television movies are the dominant media. If there's one sort of like mainstream thing that like everyone in the country potentially is going to see, it's going to be a film or it's going to be a TV show. Um, even video games is like becoming more and more accepted and wide, wide, widespread, but they're not nearly at the same level as TV and movies. And yeah. so I think that if there's something popular on TV, that's what's going to be the sort of thing that will get people interested in the game. Yep. And so, you know, with that, I wonder if it might not be a requirement that we follow TV's formula once a week. You know, I mean, I hate to say it because I, more than anything, I want the game to be developed to a point where there are truly genuine ramifications for your actions and one person's playthrough is markedly different from another person's playthrough. Yeah. And I, I'm starting to get that feeling in The Wolf Among yeah. Us way more than I got in The Walking Dead. Yeah. And yet... I don't know if I would be able to wait a month and a half or whatever between each episode. Cause like I, I, would, I would hate it. I've been playing the walking dead season two every time an episode drops. I still haven't played episode four that came out. Like I've heard some bad days things ago. about it too. And I'm trying really hard not to avoid spoilers because of, right. I don't want to spoil myself, but I'm, there's been some pretty bad, big uh, blowback for that episode four. Yeah. Well, and see from what I've experienced myself is that this weight I feel like they're losing their own vision, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, because I played episode one of season two, and I loved it. It was fantastic. It, like, the narrative wasn't really there, but they approached Clementine's character in the correct way. Because oh. you have now transferred from Lee as the surrogate father to Clementine as somebody who is self-sufficient but still requires adults. You know, she's a kid. Yeah, you know, yeah. And so you, as the player, take the role instead of the person who inhabits the avatar, you essentially play the mediator, and so you are playing in such a way that you're manipulating the various variables of the game to make sure that Clementine has the best outcome. And so you're kind of playing like bird's eye view of the situation, like it's a game of chess, hmm. 
and I don't think that works for me. Who's the dialogue are you control? Clementine. Clementine, so it's always Clementine, but yeah. you're trying to use Clementine basically as your way to manipulate Yeah, you're essentially else. using Clementine as a tool for her own good. Okay. Because, yeah, that's the thing that kind of worried me when, once I heard they, it announced that you were going to be playing as Clementine, because um, she was far and away the, the character that I liked the most and connected with the most in the first Walking Dead, but I never really had the desire to play as her. I felt yeah. that you, her character is one that works so much better playing off of right. a different character. Now, say, um, you know, I'll avoid, like, actual physical or pure spoilers, but in Season 2, I think the general theme of it is a descent into darkness. Like, as Clementine, because you're this um, young girl, or young child, I should say, uh, and you're in this really brutal world, and you're still very impressionable, part of your task as Lee was to protect her from the harsh realities of the world. And now that he's not there anymore, she's starting to be affected by it. And as each episode goes on, at least the way I, the choices I've made, the way that I've been playing it, she's getting to become a pretty dark character. And I haven't played four yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if four, the, the blowback is because they might have gone too far with that darkness. Yeah, I don't, which I actually might find interesting. The way, the yeah. way you're describing it, it sounds like I'll, I'll, I might actually hate season two. It's, <laughs> it's, it's something that I've enjoyed because I've enjoyed her character arc, but I really disliked the fact that you don't have control over it as much. Like, mm-hmm. there's just not as much gameplay as there is in, like, The Wolf Among Us. But, uh, you know, the whole point of me saying this is I feel like maybe this this weight, because the development process is so different from filming a TV show. Because when you film a TV show, you have the season in mind yeah. when you film. Yeah. Right. You know, you film it from episode one to episode 13 or 14 or whatever, how many for that season, and you're done. And then you just air that steadily. Whereas with this stuff, they developed season one uh, a month to two months at a time, and then took a year-long break, and then developed uh, 400 days. And then they took a break, and then they developed the season two, one episode at a time. And I'm wondering if this it's taken this team two years to develop this whole story bit by bit by bit that the anticipation that they're trying to put in is making them lose track of their own design philosophy. So, so you're not really talking about just the different episodes of each season. You're talking about the two different seasons themselves as well. Okay. So, uh, because for a while you lost me a little bit, but I actually agree with you on that a lot. I do think that because there's been such a big gap since they did season one, um, I could totally see them losing focus. And I think that that is a danger. And that's one of the things after uh, I finished Wolf Among Us, I was excited to play another episode because I think the, the detective uh, story lends itself really well. Yeah. To yeah. It's, if there's always a new case. To use right. So, but if they wait, say a year before they even start, you know, it takes them like a year to year and a half before we get the next season. With, like how focused will they remain with this with this character and in yeah. this world? Yeah, and I think that's an interesting thing to look at, uh, into about the whole idea of anticipation, staggered releases. You know, and you know, I think as a final thought to today's podcast, we should probably broach that topic of um, how narrative formula and structure, uh, both in games and I guess also trailers, we can talk about that. Uh, how the genre and how it's portrayed actually affect the success of the weight. So it's like, you know, to sort of clarify what I'm talking about, with The Walking Dead, the reason I think that it's sort of dropping off and not being so successful is because in that first season, it's very clear that you're playing the surrogate father, you know, and you're yes. protecting her, and that's the big goal. And also, you know, to be fair, the, the gamers that, that you have playing the game, you know, most of them are going to be, um, well, they're more, let me put it this way, they're more likely to be older guys than they are to be young girls. Right. And there, there was an interesting that point. transition. Yeah, there was an interesting point that came up in one of our classes a while back yeah. that was, that we're start, starting now to see a lot more a trend of like, you know, protecting a daughter, protecting a surrogate daughter, or something. Protecting like that. Laura Croft, and protecting Ellie in The Last of Us. Because like it's kind of becoming our instinct as we've grown up with games, we guys to become fathers and to go from just like you know sort of power fantasy sort of stuff from our adolescence to becoming you know more protectors and more like you know. Down Absolutely, yeah. But you know, with that, 
that vision was very concrete in the first season. But then as it went on, you know, that formula, that narrative structure, it stopped working because both the time stretched on and Lee is gone and the direction of the narrative is changing. So now I feel like it's kind of falling apart. Whereas, excuse me, with The Wolf Among Us, it's a detective story. Right. It's a very concrete there's a mystery to solve. These are the suspects. This is what I have to do. And so you have a whole different set of narrative justification for the tension and for the weight and for the, the other weight of your actions, you know? Whereas sure. in The Walking Dead, it's this very abstract surrogate experience. And so I'm wondering if that plays very heavily into the ability of the wolf among us to have another season, you know, because if we wait a year for the next season of the wolf among us, even if they're even developing the next season of the wolf among us, right. And know, unfortunately it might have to do with sales. And like we said, it's not as popular for property. Right. But regardless, you know, if say they do and say they have just like the walking dead, they have a year's wait before the first episode of season two of the wolf among us yeah. drops. Yeah. Are we going to have the same loss of vision or do you think that because it's it's a concrete detective story and there is a formula to follow, mm -hmm. it's not going to suffer the yeah. same way? That's a good I, point. I'm also curious, too. I need to look up um, a little bit more info on this, but I, I don't know to what extent the game is based on the comic. Like, I don't know if it's following the same storyline or if it's the same characters, but a it's new a story. It's a pretty good adaptation. From like, what I hear. Have you read the comic? I, I've read a few of them. Okay, because yeah. from what I've been hearing, and I'm actually strongly considering getting into the comic when I have some time here because I really did like the the world that they had built. Yeah, incidentally, um, it's another one I think would be a good TV show. Yeah, would make a good miniseries. Mm -hmm. uh, or series. But yeah, I do think that it is based on the world itself and the characters, but it's not actually adapting a specific yeah. okay. story. It's an adaptation. I, mean, I, I would of, hope not. Yeah. Because it's a mystery. Yeah, It's an adaptation of the narrative like themes, mm -hmm. but not the plot. Yeah. A really interesting thing to look at is uh, the difference between these sort of concrete narratives, because even though um, uh, The Walking Dead is a little bit more abstract than The Wolf Among Us, it's still a very solid, like, bare-faced narrative. But then you've got, uh, I know, Jim, you haven't played it, but uh, mm -hmm. Kentucky Route Zero, right? it's very abstract it, and it's very yeah. it's artistic and it's like atmospheric and, yeah. yeah and so that game i think has suffered incredibly from delay of it, yeah. of its episodes you kind of need to take it all as a whole and like well yeah it's a very surrealist experience yeah and, you know if, if any of you haven't played it uh i really recommend you do but it's like it's one of these games that both you have to play in order and you have to play they they release like side missions and stuff like side experiences that you really should play and yet it's taken them forever to release them and so i feel like it really suffers from that whereas something like the wolf among us might not you know yeah i agree i, I think that it's not going to suffer as much as uh walking dead the more i think about it the more i think it, it lends itself to the story in fact to be perfectly honest with you, I kind of was hoping that with the, a new season of Walking Dead, they would just do all new characters. Because Me too. what I would have yeah. loved for, for season one to have ended, I would have loved for you to have some sort of a choice where you could actually go through the game and survive as Lee. But in order to do so, perhaps Clementine, Clementine would be the one die. that dies. And yeah. just to kind of see how many characters would sacrifice themselves if it meant helping her and vice versa. But then they can just close the book on on the characters and and how did their stories end well it depends on how you played that would have been more you know that's or, a, or even if Clem like makes a cameo appearance in season yeah. two but she's not but the not character. a character you yeah. know that's a really good sort of counterpoint to close out on is the concept of you know instead of having these elongated weights you know like maybe you have the weights between episodes but just close the book, you know, don't leave any suspension yeah. because at the end of the wolf among us, you know, again, spoiler free, there's kind of a cliffhanger, yeah. you know, yeah. sort it's, of, but, but it's ambiguous, but it's no, but see, I didn't, I did not take it as a cliffhanger. The way I took it was a lot of detective stories end in the sort of, you're not quite sure, like some doubt is there's supposed to be inclusion. some, some doubt at the yeah. end. And then, the next one is not going to pick up, I think, where it left off. I right, don't think it's sure. meant to be that's Right, that's not what I was getting at. What, oh. I was, like, what I'm saying is they the cliffhanger-ish thing that they ended on 
was more of an introspective thing. Right. It yes. wasn't like, well, what's going to happen next, you know? And the what's going to happen next time is a really great formula to have inter-episode, you know? Yeah. Like, what's going to happen on the next episode of The Wolf Among Us? But then when you close the series out, it's a more introspective thing. Mm-hmm. Whereas in, you know, The Walking Dead, it was very clear that there's going to be a season two. Oh, yeah. Like, they, they set it up specifically. And d- developers, of course, have talked about how it was supposed to give you this this journey of now Clementine has to be out on her own. And it, yeah. But then you've got um, what a lot of people really find to be successful in, like, Japanese anime is when it's a contained season of, like, 13 episodes. You know? And yeah. it's over. Yeah. You know? And you get these little small shows that aren't set up for these year-long runs. You know? Mm-hmm. It's just... Here's the story, yeah. A to B. And even yeah. if it is like, you know, say 50 episodes, I like it having a beginning and an end and being done. Yep, A I, to B. I, I don't like like this ongoing, like, you know, 500 episodes of Bleach and One Piece and all that sort of stuff. You know, I just, I don't find that appealing. You know, and I think that there's something to be said for the, the strength of anticipation within a narrative and then the weakness of anticipation outside of a direct narrative confine. So, yeah, sure. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I think that's going to be it for us today. Uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed our discussion over both adaptations between different media forms and how we think that those translate into their respective, you know, categories. And then our sort of preliminary talks about the wolf among us and episodic and anticipation structure. And you guys can definitely get a, a more in depth uh, feel about our opinions on The Wolf Among Us and our experiences, probably with quite a few spoilers, uh, next week on our round table. And you'll only have to wait a week. <laughs> That's right, you'll only have to wait a week. Yes. Alright, well, thanks for joining us today. Uh, again, I'm Richard. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. And thanks for joining us. Peace. Back Creek Compatible wants you to join the discussion. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment on our site, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This week, let us know which episodic games you've played and how you feel about the delivery model. Just for fun, pitch us your dream game to movie adaptation. And as always, if you have anything else to say, lay it on us. We're all ears. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.